Our first speaker up now, I met Scott Allen Buss in Nashville last year through Reverend Ray Moore when we were in Nashville for the National Re Religious Broadcasters Convention. And we sat and chatted for a little bit and I could tell right away two things from, well, three things from Mr. Buss. His intelligence, and I'm sure he thanks God for that. His patience and his positive attitude about advancing God's kingdom. His, his optimism, his zeal, and all that. I could tell right away that this was a man we needed to bring to the third annual Great Education Forum. Mr. Buss is a husband, father, speaker, author, blogger, and member of Christ the King Church in Middle Tennessee. He's married to Holly, as I mentioned. He has three children, Rosie, Wolfgang, and Sebastian. He is currently employed by the Tennessee General Assembly. He hosts the online blog, Fire Breathing Christian. I like saying that Fire Breathing Christian. It has some intensity to it, which we are just, we just need a lot of. So we need, we need a lot of that. We need a lot of passion. So Fire Breathing Christian. And he, through Fire Breathing Christian, hopes to equip and encourage Christians to better understand, proclaim, and apply the Lordship of Christ in every realm of creation. And I'll add that does he not only hope to do that, but I believe that he is doing that. Mr. Buss writes a lot about family, education, politics, economics, and culture from the Christian perspective. The idea being that fire-breathing Christian tries to tackle every issue and subject, leaving nothing untouchable and testing everything in the perfect light of Christ as revealed in his word. He has written on education, thoughts on Christ as the essential core of children's education and also there is no God-given right to worship false gods. Mr. Buss will take 50 minutes to present the satanic foundation of public schools as described in Genesis 3. Mr. Buss, come on up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, we're alive. That's encouraging. Yeah, it, it is really. It's a joy to be here today. God has given us so much to be thankful for. And uh, while we're tackling hard and heavy material here and we're operating in a cultural context that is not necessarily the most encouraging at times, we have, we must model optimism rooted in reality, not a phony kind of optimism where we're putting on blinders or where we're pretending, but if we believe Jesus is Lord and he has us here purposefully right here and now to tackle these things, that's exciting. That's yeah. invigorating. That's what we're here for. That's the context in which we're considering these things. And uh, I'm very thankful to be here with you all today. I'm particularly thankful for Kevin and his passion and all the work that he's put into this. And uh, Pastor Raymond, uh, Dr. Raymond, this, this place, this is the, my first time here and walking in, I was, I was just unprepared for the awesomeness that hits you when you come through the door. It's relatively unassuming from the outside. It, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, but when you come in, it just hits you like a skillet to the forehead kind of thing. And it, it's very impressive, very inspiring. I'm not that a, you know, a skillet to the forehead is maybe not a positive reference. I just meant in the dramatic nature of it, of it really just waking you up or putting you to sleep possibly, but no. Now, uh, so this place, what a blessing and what, a, what, an, what an encouragement it should be and what a point of reference we should take in this place as what we can be doing to build with whatever God has given us. Use it, use it. Who knows where this is going? The opportunity that we have from small beginnings to accomplish great things is something that we should be savoring because God has secured the victory. Jesus has secured the victory already. So that's the context in which we need to be considering these things. Um, and I love the fact that here we are as individuals drawn together for, over, to consider this subject in this time and the way that God sovereignly draws 
particular people to particular places at particular times to address particular issues, that that is particularly wonderful, particularly awesome. And so, yeah, we have to be, if we're not optimistic, we're not understanding what's going on here. And we're, we're believing too much of the enemy's press. So something to keep in mind. Now, I know that when we start getting happy as we should and confident as we should, sometimes that seems to conflict with a title of a message like the Satanic Foundation of Public Schools. Uh, doesn't seem like exactly the a title that you would associate with a feel-good hit of the summer or anything like that. It's hard and it's heavy, but is it true? Is there a satanic foundation for public schools? Does the Bible, does the Word of God tell us something about that? Can we learn from the Word of God whether that sort of statement is true or false? And then, based on what we learn in response to that question, what do we do? Has God given us solutions, uh, cures for the problems that now afflict the entire culture through we all, I think, would agree the education system as it's pursued in America. So before we dive in, though, we do need to address sort of a, a potential misconception, something that could derail the conversation. And, and we've done one of those things already by talking about the beauty of the context in which we're in. Even though the culture is hurting because of what we've allowed to happen in the realm of education, we do need to be aware of uh, what we're talking about and what we're not. We're, what we're not talking about here, what we're not saying here, is that there's something inherently fundamentally evil and wrong throughout about everyone and everything that's in the system. Every person that's teaching a class, every person that's playing an administrative role, every student that's in a classroom, there are, a, while they're obviously confused, they're wrong, and in some cases they may be even more seriously wrong uh, than uh, some than others. But this is not a personal attack or a personal critique of these individuals. There are people in the system who love God, who have not been taught what that means in detail as it relates to education or much, everything, much anything else. And so they are in autopilot mode. They're coasting along with what the culture has told them to embrace. And we need to be sympathetic to that as we at the same time lovingly confront and correct the misconceptions that they have so that we might help by God's grace to set them free. Do we love do we love public school teachers? We'd better love public school teachers. If we're here because we have a personal animosity towards individuals within the system, that's a problem. That's a problem we need to deal with. So if we truly love the children and we truly love the people who are in this system, who are managing the system, then we have to love them enough to share truth with them and we have to do it in a, hum a personally humble manner. One of the things that we, Reformed Christians in particular, one of the things we should know better than most, but tend to practice not so well, is, the, is an awareness of grace, God's grace in our own lives. And so if you and I understand that we've been supernaturally saved and transformed into new creatures in Christ, and that it is only by His grace that we know anything good, anything right or anything true, then that will prevent us from becoming arrogant, puffed up with ego, looking down our nose or pointing and screeching. I think of the title of this, this message, The Satanic Foundation of Public Schools. It's very easy to imagine or for someone to, to promote the notion that anyone who would say such a thing must be pointing and snarling while they do it. And we must have some sort of a, a condescension about us, a self-righteous attitude. No, we just want to know the truth. Is there a foundation for all education? Does the, the Bible present us with, with a description of what a satanic foundation looks like? And does the Bible present us with a foundation as to what a Christ-centered foundation looks like? And if you don't have a Christ-centered foundation, you're going to have some version of a satanic foundation. And that's what we're going to be diving into in some detail here today. But it's the optimism. When we talk about optimism, I'm so glad that uh, Kevin had mentioned this. And it's uh, when, when Kevin meant one thing, when he mentions patience, as an Irish guy, and just a guy, <laughs> but an Irish guy who's working in the political realm there in Nashville, patience is definitely, any patience I have is a God-given gift uh, to the nth degree, of course. Um, but the optimism, the optimism to me just comes much more naturally. Uh, I think that the more we understand and appreciate who Jesus is, 
If we know who Jesus is, that, that brings optimism. And now the impatience can come when we get frustrated with other people who aren't quite seeing things that way or people who aren't doing things the way we think they ought to be, be done. But again, we have to be gracious and patient with those who just don't understand certain truths yet, understanding ourselves that we're all works in progress, each and every one of us. When I reflect back on what I believed not that many years ago, it's chilling. I'm a public school product. I have very fond memories of many teachers and even administrators in the system. Those fond memories don't become illegitimate or somehow off limits because now I understand the rotten foundation under the system that they were working in. They do take on a different context and we need to recognize that, but we have to love these people. We have to love them as we've been commanded to love them. And so we want to we want to focus on that and, and take that spirit of optimism, understanding that the battle we're engaged in here, if we look at the culture and if we listen to people who would hear the sorts of things that might be taught here and shrug them off or roll their eyes, we could become depressed. We could become a little demoralized. We could succumb to pessimism. But this battle that we're engaged in will be won. It will be won in time and in space by the grace of God through his spirit filled people in accordance with his gospel fueled great commission. And where this gets really cool on just a sort of a selfish, I hope in the right way, personal way is that he has chosen us to be those instruments. What a blessing when you want, when I, I love watching a, a sci-fi and fantasy sometimes, or, and it doesn't have to be sci-fi or fantasy, but any sort of fantastic story, a fictional story, or even a historical uh, telling of a, a, an incredible historical situation, we marvel at the, the heroic figure that faces incredible odds, over, seemingly overwhelming darkness, and yet they, they go from that point to victory over time. When we understand that that's basically where God has put us as his people right here and now, that's exciting. That's exciting. We have that kind of an opportunity. And so I would, would encourage uh, you all to dwell on that, uh, c convey that. The last thing we want to be con conveying to a watching world, we don't want to be modeling cowardly fear, doubt, pessimism, anything like that at all. It's just not the nature of our God at all. Fear of the Lord, that's the only fear we should know. Anytime we're fearing anything or anyone else, we're modeling rebellion against the God we're claiming to serve with our lips. So that's very important. Now, with Christ having secured the victory and us understanding that we have some, we're, we've been placed in a supernaturally blessed, very cool situation, what we need to do is take the time to orient ourselves as we're considering passages like Genesis 3 and be thinking, what, what, what might be here that we've not considered before, that I've not considered before? I know the first time that I read Genesis 3 with education really in mind was not that long ago, not many years ago, probably about six years ago is when it really hit me in this way. And, one, and as I'm sure this has happened with you all in many different uh, contexts as you're going through scripture, you read something, it hit, you've read it a who knows how many times before, or you've heard it preached, and then it just hits you again, kind of like that skillet situation we were talking about earlier. It pops you in the head. You learn, you see something that should have been obvious all along, but it wasn't. And this again is a reminder of God's grace in our lives. Until he chooses to open our eyes to a truth, we're not going to see it. And we need to remember that as we're sharing these truths with other people. I'm not going to argue this into, I'm not going to argue anyone to, into agreeing with these things, understanding this this way. You're not either. But we need, let's go to the word now. Let's consider as we uh, dive into Genesis 3, what exactly the Lord is showing us about foundations of worldview, education, and the pursuit of knowledge. But before we do that, let's, let's pray as we end, dive into the word of God. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the revelation of who you are, your person, your living personality reflected in your perfect word. Thank you for what you've shared with us. Thank you for, for your purposes, choosing us to hear these words now. I pray that you would sweep aside distractions, that you would move us to embrace what you, what you show us here and that we might act, that we might model your nature and our approach to this critical life and civilization defining subject, the subject of education. 
And I ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and help us to become more like you and to do what you would have us to do, not out of any sort of dry legalistic obligation, but because we love you personally. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the, any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So what we're, what we're seeing here, one area of focus, and there's obviously so much to be mined from this passage. Obviously, every passage in scripture is infinitely deep. There's, there's always another layer or an infinite amount of layers to, to examine. And yet here we're seeing, obviously, a turning point in human history, a fundamental turning point in human history. What I'm suggesting and encouraging you to, encouraging you to consider today is how this relates to the pursuit of knowledge. What, Because I think that's a fairly clear presentation here is the serpent is presenting an alternative approach to the pursuit of knowledge, a fundamentally different approach to the pursuit of knowledge. And it is not a stretch at all to describe the pursuit of knowledge as education. They're synonymous concepts. Education is the pursuit of knowledge. So. This is a pro a, a, the introduction of an educational philosophy by the serpent in Eden. And when we recognize that as such, I could almost, I won't, I, I won't spare you the rest of the presentation by actually stopping right there. But really, if we just stop and settle right there, that's enough. If we understand that the serpent here is presenting a philosophy of education. What is the philosophy of education? It has to do with setting aside the word of God and pursuing his creation or knowledge of his creation. It's really that simple. This is not rocket science. This is not tricky. It's not complicated. It's simple. Now by simple, I don't mean small. This touches everything. And by simple, I don't mean easy. This is a very hard thing. But ultimately, we're talking about lordship at its most basic level, truth and knowledge, epistemology. And we're gonna be getting into some, I'm sure as the day progresses, We'll be getting into a lot of $50 words, you know, real Scrabble winners like epistemology, eschatology, presuppositionalism, maybe, you know, and those are good terms. They're useful terms. But this conference and this subject does not need that sort of complexity to really address and point properly to the very simple, clear, fundamental point. Either Jesus is the beginning of all knowledge or he isn't. It's no more complicated than that. It really isn't. There's not any amount of rationalization that we can do. There's no amount of spin that can change it. He is that essential core of all true knowledge on every subject in all of his creation. And this is, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And it's a beautiful thing. That, how hard is that to understand? It's not hard to understand. What we're having a lot of problem with, trouble with apparently is applying it. You know, what do we do with that truth? And so far, I would uh, propose in the context, certainly of state managed education, public schools, the Genesis three model, the satanic concept, the philosophy in, uh, presented there by the serpent is the foundation of public schools. It just is. I don't say that meanly. I'm not trying to just unduly agitate a teacher, many of whom I love, anyone who's involved in the bureaucracy of this, no, or, and certainly not any student, but it, it is either true or it isn't. And what we're gonna consider a little bit further and in some detail here is why that is a truth that we need to accept and deal with. So we're talking about foundations. We're talking about starting points. We're talking about the basics. Uh, and so this is why when we're trying to get at the, the foundation of a worldview, the foundation of an approach to truth, an approach to education, the pursuit of knowledge. This is why we wanna to go to the beginning and this is why we're in Genesis three. 
so when we're thinking of Genesis 3, when we're just thinking of where we're at, and it's no mystery. I know when I'm talking with uh, good, godly Christian men and women who are also in the capital in Nashville, it's the one thing no one denies, and, and everyone even talks about it one way or another, is that our culture, the American culture, is going to hell on a rocket. That is plain. Nobody debates that. Nobody denies it. A lot of people like to, to uh, complain about it. And some of that complaint is valid. Some of it's just noise, though, because ultimately it doesn't seem as though we're very serious about dealing with the cause of this problem, of this serious problem. And so some questions to consider in light of, of, of Scripture uh, in Genesis 3 in particular. What started us as a people, as image bearers of God, what started us down a path that led us to where we are right here and now in the 21st century, particularly in America, but throughout the West? I believe Genesis 3 provides us with answers to that question. What is the fundamental life, culture, and civilization corrupting lie that was first pitched in Eden? Genesis 3 gives us that answer. Why do we live in a culture that embraces the pursuit of knowledge apart from submission to the word of God? Genesis 3 gives us that answer. What is the foundation of state-run public schools in America? Genesis 3 tells us. It's more a matter of, do we want to hear? Do we want to see? Do we want to know? The clarity has been provided. Now we're responsible for that clarity. And that was, you know, God's word has spoken. God has spoken clearly. We are without excuse. And so I'm encouraged that we have folks gathered here and some who are watching online and who knows who may hear this later and build upon uh, what the, the concepts we feebly try to express here today. But by God's grace, good things are coming here. Victory is coming in this realm. But we're, we're right now at ground zero, at the basic level. We have to just acknowledge, acknowledge the basic problem. We have to, we, you know, the 12-steppers do get some things right. You know, before you can solve a problem, you have to admit we have a problem. And while I think we're willing to admit as a culture that we have a problem in the general sense, we don't want to deal with the specific problem that we're going to focus on here today. So diving back, I'm going to re repeat some of the passage that I just read, and then we're going to move on from there to see how this correlates with other passages in Scripture and how we can tie this all together. Again, in ways that anyone can understand. This is very basic, very simple stuff. Again, Genesis 3, 1 through 6, he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So now, while there's obviously a lot to mine here, there are three points that I really want to make and repeat, three attributes basically of the serpent's pitch that I think we should focus on, that we're well served to focus on. First of all, the serpent is encouraging, a core component here is the encouragement of idolatry. We're being encouraged, the pitch centers on being uh, encouraging people to have to make an idol of knowledge of creation, to pursue more knowledge, to pursue creation, to exalt it in a way above and beyond God's word or authority. So there's a, an idolatry that's at the core. Idolatry is being promoted. And then sort of hand in glove with that, and you could argue that maybe these could be reverse order, but there's covetousness, idolatry and covetousness. We're, we're encouraged to create the idol, then covet it, in a way that then leads to the third point, that being theft. We're encouraged to steal, to take for ourselves on our terms, knowledge about God's creation so that we can use it on our schedule according to our whims, the way we want to use it. We want to use it practically to pursue the American dream or whatever else, just uh, to get us what we want, when we want it, how we want it. That's theft. We want God's stuff. We want Jesus' possessions, Jesus' property, without him. Amen. We want to be in his place and we want his stuff. We don't want him. This is fundamental uh, to how you approach reality, education, truth, everything. So this, these ideas, idolatry, covetous, and covetousness, and theft are three core elements of the serpent's pitch, the serpent's presentation or introduction of a philosophy <coughs> of education. 
and this is important to tie together, education as it relates to covetousness, idolatry, and theft. These are things we're going to bring together. How we understand education and how we understand these other concepts and how it all fits together. So we see that we are encouraged uh, to, to make idols of God's creation, covet that covet those idols to the point of attempting to sort of steal them and use them on our own terms. Very important. So the satanic theory uh, of the pursuit of knowledge is not, again, it's, it's, it's very, very simple. It's very simple in that in order for us to believe to embrace any of these components, we have to reject any if, for us to pursue idolatry, for us to pursue covetousness, for us to pursue theft or acquisition of God's creation on our own terms. It's a fundamental, simple rejection of the Lordship of Christ. It's that it is that simple at its core. And what we need to see in Genesis three is though are those components of the presentation, understanding that when we're talking about knowledge, the tree of knowledge. And the serpent is advising you and I and Eve as to how to properly pursue knowledge. That is education. That it's, this is, we're not connecting distant dots here. They're the same. That is what's being pitched here is an approach to education. And what we need to then understand is that any system, if there is a system built on that Genesis 3 model of education, if there is, then that system a system built on that foundation cannot be repaired. It is irreparable. It can't be fixed. It can't be saved. It has to be torn down. It has to be torn down. Public schools, as we understand them, public schools built on this foundation are no more, no more salvageable than strip clubs. You can't reform a strip club. You can't reform Christ dismissing approaches to education. You can, it, as those things, if reformation comes to those things, they cease to be. They've changed so fundamentally that they go away. They become something completely different. And so it's not as though when we say, and this is, we're in such a statist mode in America that to say something like public schools shouldn't exist for a typical American, and I thought this way until not that long ago, for a typical American, that's like saying, Education shouldn't exist, you know, because they, we can't imagine if the state's not going to do it, who is? It won't actually happen, you know, and this is how deep down the rat hole we've gone to where most of the population, most actual Christians in biblically grounded churches even think that way. So that's where we're at. And so what we need, so it's a hard initial confrontation point to say, no, this can't be fixed. These can't exist in God's creation. And ultimately, they won't. It's just a matter of time before he grinds them under his heel. People like to wonder where America is in scripture. That's a common theme of discussion. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to take a left turn in a bad way down eschatology lane here or anything, you know. But one place I would encourage people to look who are wondering about America in scripture is just Psalm 2. Because I think Psalm 2 tells us a lot about where we're heading. And where we, you know, apart from repentance, apart from reformation, uh, we're, we're heading, we, we're deserving of the judgment of God. And as long as we embrace satanic approaches to children's education, satanic approaches to the pursuit of knowledge, it can't, it can't get better. You can't fix this. We can't tweak it. Uh, the public education system, this approach to, to the pursuit of knowledge, this Genesis 3 satanically inspired approach to education is the quintessential enemy stronghold. It is. You, you, it's hard to find one that's more clear. I use the strip club example because we have no trouble seeing that. You have no trouble. That is jarring. That is so crystal clear and obvious. And yet, it's really not any more so than Christ dismissing public education. And frankly, if we didn't have a Christ dismissing approach to the pursuit of knowledge, we wouldn't have things like strip clubs dotting the landscape. One flows from the other. And that's one of our primary problems uh, with the way we've all been educated and programmed is now we as conservative Christian types in America are conditioned to be content tackling the symptom of the symptom of the symptom of the symptom of a problem. We don't even necessarily want to know what the root cause is anymore. And until we go to the root cause, until we deal with Genesis 3 as though it's actual history, as though it actually represents the fundamental shift 
in an approach to reality that sent the whole cosmos down the rat hole, once again, until we deal with that, there is no hope. There's only what we've been getting in America over at least as long as I've been alive. I mean, the political process is farcical. Conservative activism, as it's understood in America now, again, at best, they nibble at the edges of the symptom of the symptom of the symptom. We have to go to the core. And people are beginning to know one of the benefits that we have, one of the blessings of the dark hour in which we live is that people are being, people are being jolted or jarred into at least looking at things that they really were comfortable ignoring previously. And one of those things is the nature of education. There are more and more people, by God's grace, are being woke, we're, we're waking up. And it's a splash of cold water in the face that's causing it usually. But if that's what it takes, praise God. Hallelujah. Let's run with it. Uh, but until we move beyond symptomatic uh, obsessions, d dealing with the things that are the results of this, that are the results of this, that are a product of a satanic approach to the pursuit of knowledge, we're just going to be playing endless whack-a-mole. You know, it's just one thing <clears throat> after another, and it just gets worse. It just gets worse. Only when we deal head-on with reality, and we, we take the Word of God, and we treat it as though it's actually the Word of an actual God. The God, the one and the only one. He has said these things for our benefit. He's not, the Lord has not shared this information just for himself. There's a sense in which all things ultimately are to his glory, but there was no necessity on his part of sharing these details with us. He wants us to have this for his purposes. He's given us this information, this clarity as a tool. And now we have the obligation to use that clarity, use that tool. Uh, and this is, so this is what we're here for today. And some of the passages, what we really need to reflect on, because there's so many of these, what I would call like hallmark card worthy phrases that were, or verses that we're all very familiar with. We need to just stop, think about education, how we train children, how we form their minds in light of certain passages in scripture, crystal clear banner passages. And we, we need to ask ourselves, do we actually believe what God is telling us? When we see when we're told the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, well, the, then the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or it's not. It is or it isn't. There's not a middle ground. There's not a middle ground. And how we answer that question, where we come down on that issue, will determine, will chart our course on education. It will. We may not believe it, but if we, if the, the course, or maybe I should put that the other way, the course we chart on education tells a watching world whether we believe that passage is true. That's the reality. We're modeling belief or rejection of the word of God in the way we educate children, in the way we pursue education in, in any context. Another passage, all treasures, all treasures of knowledge and wisdom are hidden in the person of Jesus. That's either true or it isn't. It, it is or it isn't. There is no middle ground. There is no neutral position to be taken. All subjects and areas of inquiry in God's creation, from logic, law, and beauty to economics, business, and technology, are either made by him, for him, and through him, and sustained by him in every moment of time, or they're not. Now, if the answer to these questions is yes, 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 this, this is truth, then that's central to the way we approach any subject that we would teach anybody at any time in any place. It's, it's core. This is foundational. And when the serpent con convinces us to set that foundation aside and build on something else, what do we get? America. That's what we get. Yeah, look around. And it's not getting better until the Lord graces us with repentance and submission to him in educational practice. This is the trajectory that we deserve. Really, we deserve much worse, but this is what we have. <coughs> so Christ is the foundation and he has to be the foundation in real world educational practice where the rubber meets the road in every detail. That's the idea. And that sounds so to an unbeliever or an immature believer who's not yet grown by the grace of God in the word. There's not a lot of depth there yet. When you're coming from a, a worldly perspective or you have the residue of a worldly perspective all over you, that just sounds ugly and hard. Oh, but because, of course, lordship grates on us by our fallen nature. We don't, we want to be what the serpent encourages us to be. You can be like God, do it your way, set him aside, pursue his stuff, learn how, how many times have you had the conversation? I certainly, 
I couldn't count how many times I've had started to talk about education along these lines. And the idea will be brought up that, but you can teach math without teaching Christianity, but you can teach that you can't. And so with a focus on the practical, and I would never deny that a person can properly learn that two plus two is four, that sort of thing. Obviously you can learn that, but are you truly teaching a subject? What other, what subject would we, if, if you, if we sent our children off to an expensive college where every subject that was covered, they insisted upon never acknowledging, much less considering the author of any work of art or any piece of literature that they were going to study, never contemplating his motive, his or her motive, his explanation, never, that's, that's idiotic. That's nonsensical. And yet that's how the serpent encourages us to think about everything. And we are happy to do that, which is why we have fundamentally corrupted all the beautiful things that God made, God owns, and God has given us economics, philosophy, logic, law, all of it. It all belongs to him. And yet we, by taking this satanic bait and moving along the Genesis 3 path, we have corrupted them all profoundly. And we need to understand that when we're seeing the sorry state of art, media, politics, law, all of it, it all comes down to education. We have been programmed to embrace a satanic approach to all of these things by denying the Lordship of Christ over them. So the question really that we need to be asking is, are we building on truth? Do we even desire truth? Do we desire truth? The truth about language, uh, art, logic, law, every other subject, and the question, when we ask the question about, do we desire truth? We have to understand that as Christians, we're not talking about a set of rules or laws. That's part of what we're talking about as an expression of something bigger that we need to be pointing to. And that bigger thing, that all encompassing thing is the person of Jesus Christ. It's him personally. When we say, what is truth? Or I would like to know the truth, or I would like to pursue truth, or let's teach the truth of a matter. That begins of necessity, if it's pursued truthfully, in the personal nature of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a personal thing. He personally embodies and sustains all truth in his creation. So it's beyond just, here's what you do, here's what you don't do, here's what the law of God lovingly commands to do or not do. That's all very important. We need to understand all of those expressions, though, in God's word as reflections of his personal nature. And this is where love comes into the thing. When we're talking about loving the law of God as a, as a reflection of the nature of God, it only makes sense then when you have personality involved and then you have love and it becomes this thing that for an unbeliever, for someone who's only used to looking at sets of rules or hearing things as dry legalistic commands, love doesn't really fit in that context and personal relationships don't really fit. But Christianity, the God of creation, it's all about him personally. Everything in his creation is connected with him personally and dependent upon him. So what we need to be asking is, are we, and as we're pursuing education is, do we want just to learn math so that we can be better at math, so that we can get a better job, so that we can earn more money and have more stuff? In other words, are we chasing after God's things like prosperity, uh, knowledge of mathematics, material, wealth, these sorts, all, all these sorts of things, intellectual uh, pursuits? Are we chasing after those things above him? Have we made those things idols? Are we rationalizing a pursuit of those things while setting aside his word as the guide to properly understanding and pursuing all of those things? And uh, it all comes down to uh, again and again, are we accepting or rejecting the serpent's pitch in Genesis 3? Are we idolizing knowledge? Are we not encouraged to idolize knowledge, to make an idol of knowledge? Uh, of prosperity, of money, which is kind of synonymous, but not necessarily. Are we encouraged to covet these things? Of course. The system used to educate most children in America either encourages these things or it doesn't. And 
when we read Genesis 3 and we see the culture around us and we see there's no conflict or there's no contradiction, it's not very confusing, it's very plain, simple, and clear. The system advocated, the approach to education advocated in Genesis 3 by the serpent is exactly what we do in public schools. Exactly. There's no deviation whatsoever. You, you know, one of the ways in which a lot of uh, conservatives and Christians are, are aiming to address public schools, try to tweak them, make them a little bit better, more tolerable, bring it around is we, you'll hear things like, we need more founding fathers. You know, we need more founding fathers. We need more accurate American history taught. And look, are those bad things to teach accurately? No, not at all. It would be wonderful to have more accurate information about the founding fathers and American history. But what we've come to believe in a culture that has been programmed thoroughly through state-managed education is that you can fix this education problem not by submitting to Jesus as Lord and bringing Jesus in as the, the lens through which education is approached, but by bringing in more American icons, more American icons, more George Washington, you know? And we actually have come to believe that education can be saved through George Washington. While, here's where it gets much worse, at the same time, embracing the idea, most Christians embrace the idea automatically, by default, well, of course we can't teach that Jesus is, is God in school. Of course. We can't do that. Why do they believe that? Because they've been discipled. Yeah. We've been discipled by the state to think that way. And this is a very religious thing. Public education is profoundly religious and it does advance and it is centered on, built around what I would call sort of the unofficial official religion of the United States of America. And that religion is state supervised polytheism, yep. state supervised polytheism, state managed polytheism. The idea being that we say there's no true religion. We, we say there's no official religion of the United States. But practically, in every measurable way, at every opportunity, we make it crystal clear and we enforce the notion that, yeah, you can be a Christian and you can have your Jesus and so and George over there can have Buddha and you know we can have Muslims with Allah over here and whatever. Whatever your God is, we will respect them all equally under the official ruling authority, which is the state. Which does what then? That, that means the state... Practically speaking, the state is God in practice then. That's the religion taught in public schools, and that's the religion, the religious perspective, that most professing Christians in America, and when I say professing Christians, I just want to be clear, in that category, there are obviously many true Christians. There are false converts. I mean, Scripture speaks to these things. I'm not trying to say every at all that everyone who's who's not getting it on this level is just a air quote Christian. They're not real. I don't mean that at all. But in America, the overwhelming majority of pro professing Christians have embraced state managed polytheism as their religion in practice. Yeah. And that's why we're where we're at today. That's why now you have a culture that the state is expected to take care of everything, manage everything. It's, it's a given. Most conservatives now in America are stark raving socialists. Stark, I mean, off the charts. And not, this is not tricky. It's get out the 10 planks from the Communist Manifesto, read them, and then just check off which ones in some form you're for as a conservative in America. And most conservatives, and what better example is there than public schools? Public schools, stark raving socialism. If you're, if you celebrate, exalt, and want to want to cherish and defend and hold up public schools, state-run children's education as a thing, as like a good American thing, stop calling yourself conservatives and, and understand you're not embracing a Christian worldview, but it, even beyond that, just practically speaking on the shallow political realm, it's ridiculous to say you're conservative when you want the state to sculpt the minds of the young. State Managed children's education will produce and has produced a state dependent population by design. This is not accidental. So Genesis 3 tells us probably a whole lot more 
than we want to know or want to deal with necessarily as Christians in America, but it gives us such clarity on the subject that we, we have to go there. We have to love the Lord enough. We have to love our neighbor enough to consider the fundamental reality that's been pitched by the serpent in Eden, that's been embraced by humanity, and that right now in America is the foundation of our public school system. If we love these students, if we love these teachers, if we love the administrators, the bureaucrats, the people we make the most fun of or get most frustrated with, when the jokes are done, if we're serious and we really love these people, we want to show them the light here. We want to help. And we need to be, be doing that clearly in a spirit of personal humility, um, but we need to be doing it. We need to be doing it. We cannot run. The, the, the culture is where it is now because the church has allowed this to happen. And when we're thinking then of how to have a conversation with someone who's in this place, who's not considered these things from a biblical perspective, and maybe God is using you in a particular moment, you're the one who's going to break this ice. You're the one who's going to share these truths. A passage that's very near and dear to most homeschoolers' hearts, Christian educators' hearts, Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. We're going to read through Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment, the, stat the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. First of all, how's that for contrast with the Genesis 3 model? Okay, we have the Genesis 3 model and the Deuteronomy 6 model. They're addressing the same basic thing here, okay? How's that for contrast? How's that for juxtaposition? There's a lot of clarity right there when you just one in one column, the other in the other column, and you look at that. And what we need to focus on here, though, before we get into the, the, the more practical, tangible details, is we need to see here, we're, again, and we can skip over this, love the Lord your God with all. You shall love, love you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Love the Lord personally. Okay, so the statutes and the rules are a part of that expression, but it's love directed to a person, not a list. Right? Very important distinction. Now, you're going to hear a lot. You, you, surely you've all probably, many of you have heard it a lot more than I have. But one, one line that I get in one form or another is, well, but that's just a passage from the Old Testament. Go, don't read too much into that. You know, it's just the Old Testament. And so what we want to do is touch on a few New Testament passages to help uh, some who may need help bridging that gap. I mean, that's a terrible approach to have to Scripture, of course, separating it that way. And yet, it's commonly held because we're so biblically illiterate and disrespectful of the Lordship of Christ, that that's taken root. So Mark 12, verses 28 through 30, we're going to go there, where we are told that one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And this is, of course, pointing directly to a passage that may be familiar to you. You may have heard it a few minutes ago in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6. Then we see, and this is very interesting, the first time I saw this, I literally got chills, and it was not that long ago. This was very cool to me, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't see it much sooner. But when Jesus and the devil, when the devil is, tempt, is attempting to tempt Jesus, which that's something incredible to think about, Something, what, what are we being told about the nature of the devil that he would actually quote scripture 
to the word made flesh. There's a fundamental insanity here, right? I mean, that is crazy. That's crazy. And yet, that's what he does. That, that's a rabbit to chase another time. But we're, as related to our subject here, there's a very interesting tie-in, I think. In Matthew 4, verses 1 through 4, we read that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We see that in Deuteronomy 8. And that concept is elsewhere as well, but it's Deuteronomy 8. And then in Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6, 16. In Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10, we continue. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written... You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Deuteronomy 6.13, paraphrases from these different passages. So in three of the four responses, two to the, to the devil specifically, and then one in response to the question regarding what is, what is the, the pinnacle of the law, three of the four responses, we're, we have direct appeals from Jesus to passages in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, Deuteronomy 6.13, and Deuteronomy 6.16. So what does that maybe tell us about Deuteronomy 6, 7? Maybe it's important. Maybe it counts. Maybe it's legitimate. Maybe it's central. It's in the middle of all of this. So if you would say that, yeah, that's the answer. It, it, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 7 is, is important in light of those other re uh, related contexts, related citations. And yeah, you've discerned wisely. That is exactly what's going on here. Deuteronomy 6, 7 is vital. It is central. So what we see in this juxtaposition of Genesis 3 and Deuteronomy 6 is a clear contrast between two diametrically opposed worldview foundations. The two views, the two approaches to the pursuit of knowledge could not be more clearly opposed. Deuteronomy 6-7 is a flashpoint of clarity in this regard. Along those lines, we need to consider one last passage uh, that, that really makes another, what I found to be a remarkable connection between uh, this, the concept, fundamental worldview questions, and the next passage that we see in Deuteronomy 6-8. Um, this idea of binding on a sign on our hand and as... And, uh, and as frontlets between our eyes, we see this marking as something that's referenced in Revelation 13, 11 through 17. So if you have your Bibles, Revelation 13, 11 through 17. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to, to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, this idea of a mark, and as we see the reference in Deuteronomy, we see the reference here, there's a lot to be said for an understanding of this as if a mark on your forehead tends to be a symbol for how you think. You are, your thoughts mark you. You are marked by what's going on up here. Then the mark on your hand is a mark. Your, anything you, you do is an expression of what you think. So these marks work in harmony. One reflects the other. And so we're marked by what we think. We're marked by what we do. And satanic systems 
will always endeavor to create a culture in which those who bear the marks of Christian thought and action suffer economically and otherwise. That's basic uh, serpentine uh, approach to reality. That's the kind of culture the enemy wants. And so this idea about a mark of the beast, this has this, there are many ways of interpreting this, of course, and I'm not trying to get, get into that all at once here, but the idea of being marked by the way we think and therefore marked by what, and our, and our actions being a mark of our worldview and action, we need then to co contemplate, well, what does the education system, our education system, our approach to education, how is it marking us? How have we been marked by this process? Are we bearing the mark of the, of the beast, the mark of unbelief, the mark of rebellion? Are we bearing the mark that we're encouraged to have in Deuteronomy? It's one or the other. There's no way around it. At every corner, at every turn, at every opportunity, when we get real clarity into the goals and approach of the enemy, it points to this foundation of this fundamental idea of what is truth, how do you pursue it? What is education? What is the pursuit of knowledge? The difference between a Genesis 3 model, which is the foundation of public schools, and the Deuteronomy 6 model, which Christians are commanded and equipped by God to obey and model, could not be more stark, and it couldn't be more consequential. There, there are incredible consequences to what we're doing. And again, we're going to passages, specific passages. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3, Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do we believe these things in educational practice? Ask a teacher lovingly care don't make you know you don't need to launch right into these most agitating of conversations out of the gate build relationships sincere relationships not like because you have an agenda to eventually get to this discussion love people get to know them care about them and then if, if they're expressing proclaiming any fidelity to christ ask them do you believe any of these fundamental truths and does that are you modeling that belief in the way you teach children and hopefully that is convicting that we don't want to add to that by being unnecessarily agitating. The, the substance here is, con, is agitating enough. Very much so. <laughs> it, just, it just is. I, and when I think of how I was, and again, we, I, I, I'm a public school product. Many fond memories of many wonderful men and women that I interacted with, teachers, and just fantastic people that I'm thankful to God for. And at the same time, so it's not either or. I'm not demonstrating, and we're not demonstrating a lack of respect or regard or gratitude for the good things that God has given us in bad situations. Even through our own, we're all works in progress, right? I mean, we, we all personally understand, whether we want to admit it or not, that we've, we've, God has been very, very gracious with us when we never deserved it, and he's bringing us along. Let's help others come along. But let's be clear, we will find... Who know? It's hard to imagine the upside. How quickly we may, by God's grace, see incredible change for the better if we'll go to the root on this. Just go to Genesis three. Talk about the pursuit of knowledge, which is education, and treat the word of God as though it's the word of God. So it's a matter of belief. It's a matter of obedience, and this is central to our. Uh, the, the command that we've been given, the mission we've been given, the gospel-fueled Great Commission, discipleship. Who's going to How are we discipling people? It's the state, the enemies of Christ, it's all about discipleship. The reason we automatically default to such radically unbiblical positions is because we've been discipled to think that way. And we need to take up the challenge of confronting that with love, humility, respect, and, uh, and out of fidelity to our Lord. So as we consider, again, and I want to, one more time, I want to go through a portion of, of this passage in Genesis. For God knows, this is the serpent speaking. Right there, you have a problem with a lot of people. There's a serpent speaking. What is the serpent saying? 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. This is the philosophical foundation of public schools. It is. We can't kid ourselves anymore. We can't pretend. We can't run away. We need to repent and we need to pursue the Lordship of Christ in educational practice while we have the time and opportunity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you that you are the author, the sustainer, the definer of art, logic, law, civics, beauty, mathematics, economics, business, all of it. It all belongs to you and that the only path to true liberty, freedom, and vibrant experience of any and all of these things is by clinging to you personally. And that you would have seen fit, that you would have chosen to reveal yourself so lovingly with such clarity in your word, and that you would choose to work with us, Father. We're very humbled, thankful, awe-stricken. It's, it's mesmerizing to us in so many ways, so blindingly beautiful, and yet, Help us not to be so awestruck that we're just sort of sitting in our corners or watching things happen or, or reading nice books about truth, but that we might actually, you might inspire us. You might inspire your people to rigorously, vigorously pursue victories for you in the culture, to engage, not to engage as a perpetually antagonistic enemy of people, but to engage by building relationships, by actually loving people, loving people who are, who are enslaved and to a great extent controlled in one way or another by systems that we do hate. We hate the systems, we hate the enemy, as we must hate them, as you hate them. And yet the people that have been brought under the bondage of these systems, Father, help us to love them. Help us to want to know their names, to want to know their background, to want to know who they are, so that we can talk with them sincerely, genuinely connect with them, so that by your grace we might find our way out of the pit that we've dug ourselves into, Father. And we know, we trust that by your grace, according to your purposes, through the shed blood of your Son on the cross and the gospel that it has enabled, that that work has enabled in creation, that victory has been secured, it is assured. And that's profoundly exciting to, to us, Father. And I just ask that you would move us to contemplate these things with regularity, and that you would move us to action and to growth and grace and patience with others as we move along, all by your grace and all for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.